All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we are on to our seventh session of the day where we have uh, Raymond McCulley, a, one of our faculty members here at Singularity University. Um, he is the principal of exponential biosciences and founding faculty and chair of digital biology at Singularity University. Um, he's also the co-founder of BioCurious, which is the world's first biohacker space. Um, he's been doing some really cool stuff lately with uh, genetics around COVID-19 um, and has been plugged into a lot of the uh, research and efforts that are underway right now. So thank you for being here with us today. I'm excited for you to take us on a journey. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I've got so much to share with you guys. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I hope everybody is doing well. I'm doing pretty okay. You know, things have been kind of weird. But the nice piece for me was in the office pool for Armageddon. I had the little square that was marked a bat sneezes on a pangolin and starts a global pandemic. So I've really made out. And I want to be clear, uh, I'm not trying to make light inappropriately of the situation. I get that it's a very big deal and it's going to continue to get to be a bigger deal. But um, I hope that we can also find good things to look at and laugh as we go through. Um, I want to go ahead and tell you a little bit about what we're going to look at today. So this is my presentation and this is what we titled it which is DNA beats rock, paper, scissors, and coronavirus 2. And then the rather immodest subtitle, Genomic Supremacy in the Last War Against Disease. And so let me talk a little bit about what I mean there. So DNA and DNA technologies are probably the most powerful tool that humans have developed since fire and writing. And... DNA is what's responsible for all of evolution and natural selection. Uh, it's made world empires. And it's made fortunes for countries, companies, and people. Just moving DNA around the world, whether we're doing it with the spice trade or the British Empire planting rubber trees so that they can have telegraph lines or potatoes from the new world or the new things we're doing with agriculture now. and these technologies really give us a handle on being able to do something, not just understand, but act in our current situation. I want to share a little bit about that with you, too. I also wanted to say, I do think that we are on the verge. It's within our reach, if not our grasp, to be able to wipe out communicable diseases. But whenever I say that we're in the last war, I think we're at the first battle of the last war. So um, with that, let me make one other note. And this is on the virtue of uncertainty. And I wanted to say one of the best things we can do as we go forward in the next few weeks and months is be able to filter the information that we're getting. And one of the things that I have found incredibly useful and that I found that really smart people, Nobel laureates and uh, incredible pioneers in fields are not afraid to say, I don't know, or I don't understand that, please explain it, or we're not sure about that yet. And I would go ahead and encourage all of you to be able to say that whenever you were in that state and to be able to ask questions and to not judge harshly whenever people are saying that, even about the current state of things, which is going to be increasingly life and death for people. Uh, the virtue of uncertainty, not knowing what certain things are, being able to admit it, knowing what you don't know is going to be all important. So I hope that I will be able to tell you I don't know about some of these things, especially about what we're looking at with the coronavirus and the biology of it. Not only is the situation rapidly evolving, but the virus itself is. And so some things that we know today may be true tomorrow, tomorrow and may not be true tomorrow. Um, but there are some things that we're actually able now to answer questions and be able to do it fairly quickly. And so let's talk a little bit about that, how we're using genomics to find the ground truth about SARS-CoV-2, which is, of course, the virus responsible for the disease, COVID-19, or what we're all just calling now coronavirus. 
So one of the things that's really interesting is we are able to understand better and better where it came from. And that is because we're using DNA sequencing technology to look at current cases of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. We're also able to go ahead and look back at different times whenever we've sequenced the virus and viruses like this in the wild. And so this is a phylogenetic tree. It shows a relationship between a lot of different viruses that have been recovered in different places. You'll see all those red dots. Those are current cases in both China, the US, Europe, Japan, and those are what we now consider the coronavirus. The closest relationship that it's got is to bats and pangolins, not the organisms themselves, but viruses that have infected those. More and more, the scientific consensus is basically that at some point, these three animals came together. And we think that this probably originated in bats. It might have had pangolins as an intermediate host, and it was something that mixed with uh, humans. And because this came together, it was able to mutate and evolve and jump hosts as some of these zoonotic diseases do. And this is interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about this. And this is interesting, not just from a research perspective, but also one of the things as we are putting out the fire in the house now, we're going to have to go back and figure out where the fire started because this is not something that we want to see jumping again out of uh, an animal reservoir and infecting more people. Uh, this is something that we know is actually an area of active study in China right now, and hopefully this is something the whole world will be able to participate in. Uh, more about that. Here's another thing that we've actually been able to determine. The virus itself is almost certainly not human-made, and this is based on a really great paper um, and several different papers that have contributed to this and also some work that I've been doing myself. Um, the paper is referenced at the bottom of the slide, the proximal origins of SARS-CoV-2. But among other things, the authors of this say, whenever you look at the six particular amino acid mutations that had to take place for the spike protein in SARS to be able to grab on to the ACE2 protein and human cells and bond, they really weren't very good mutations. We've actually studied what it would take to increase this being a, a bad virus, and basically nature picked some lousy ways to do it, uh, enough to cause us a lot of problems, but if we were actually designing it from scratch, we would have done a better job. Not that we want to design it from scratch, but among other things, we're also able to look and see that this is not based on or related to any viruses that were really known before that you would have used as a backbone if you were genetically engineering this from scratch. Um, but we do think that basically some of the things where we are seeing these animals from the wild, from different places that would never have mixed before, whenever they are able to do this in, uh, for instance, some of these wet markets, or because we're impinging upon previously wild territory, this is what is causing this problem, and that's sufficient. We don't need to really look for a, a human explanation for this. Again, just like with the animal origin, there are uncertainties and it's under debate, but this is under debate, but this is one of those things like climate change or gravity, where it's a theory, but it looks like a pretty good one. So, you know, keep that in your back pocket when you're talking to people going forward. Here's another thing, just we know a huge amount about the coronaviruses in general and this one in particular. Here is a map actually of the about 14 genes and 30,000 nucleotides bases showing where this varies in different places. This is something that we have now, uh, not just one sequence of this, the first sequence it was made after we saw the first cases reported on New Year's Eve, was released by the Chinese government about a month later as different people got samples of this. We uh, were able, saw different governments, research labs, and companies being able to sequence this with and release it within three days. 
the sequence that we are looking at there, and that's what a gene map really looks like, not the funny things that Hollywood shows you for DNA maps, um, actually is based on over 500 different sequences of the evolving SARS-CoV-2. We're also able to go ahead and plot those against maps as we find different people in different places, and we can go ahead and use how these viruses are related to try to understand how this is spreading. We actually have this opportunity to perhaps track by using DNA sequencing the whole evolution of an epidemic and now a pandemic in real time. And this is, again, not just uh, something interesting with research, but this is something that is really going to be uh, useful for our understanding and ability to fight this particular disease and any future diseases. I wanted to point out the some of the slides that I've been showing you are from a resource called Next Strain, and that is available to you right now. It's a place that you can go and see all of these things and actually understand how this works. And I wanted to take a, just a moment to do a bit of a sidebar. We'll talk a little bit about this later. When I was a kid, when I was about 12 years old, I actually got my uh, first calculator, which was a Texas Instruments 30, and it was the little black plastic case, and it had so many buttons for things that I didn't know what they were, and I remember being fascinated by the trigonometry functions on it, and I basically spent a summer messing with all those buttons and figuring out what they did and graphing things, and it was like one of my first exposures to understanding how the secret gears behind the world work. And I want to go ahead and recommend, if you're a young person watching this, if you've got kids, and I mean between 6 and 20, uh, who are at all interested in this, take them over to Next Strain, have them go ahead and hit some of these buttons. And just like I was trying to figure out how sin, cos, and tan, and all the different exponential functions on my calculator work, this is a way for them to figure out what's going on with biology and molecular biology, and that's become not just an important job skill for the future, but in some ways a survival skill. So I think that this is a great way to actually use the crisis that we're in as a bit of a teachable moment, and we will talk some more about that later. The next thing I wanted to talk about was how we're reading DNA, and what I mean is we're not just doing this for research like we looked. But we're actually using this, of course, to diagnose and try to fight this virus. And um, again, in our rapidly evolving situation, I think very few people are unaware of what is going on with testing around the world, but in particular in the United States. And several people have been approaching me and we've been talking about what we need to do to improve testing. I want to say most of the problems with our testing are not technical problems, they're coordination problems. They're problems where initially there were really high restrictions on who could be tested, at least in the United States, on which government agencies were in charge and what tests they were choosing, uh, having very complex standards. And now we're actually moving to a point where a lot of private companies are picking up this slack, but now we're having trouble figuring out really even how many cases there are, who's reporting what and when, and this is going to be an ongoing problem. Um, if you look, though, at the technical problems that are associated with this disease testing, whenever you're testing for the disease, you're actually looking for a particular sequence of RNA bases in somebody's saliva. And being able to do that means that you have a special kind of machine called an RT-PCR machine. Well, there's a lot of different kinds of RT-PCR machines. And the kinds that we use in hospitals, for point of care testing, the kind that we use ordinarily to test for research, the kind that we would use in a biotechnology lab to do work going forward are all different and have different capacities. They all work on basically the same principles and really just having the information of the sequence of this virus should be enough for us to do a lot of this testing and has been, but agreeing on how that testing is gonna work has been a problem. Going forward, having high-capacity machines that are available is going to be an issue. And let me go ahead and do another quick sidebar here. This will be an issue not just in the United States, which has been incredibly slow given what should be our technological prowess and availability of these resources. 
this will be a huge issue for the developing world. This disease, both diagnosing it and treating it, are something that is going to work much better for rich nations than poor nations. And we need to keep that in mind as we're going forward. And we'll talk about that again. The other thing that we're doing as we're moving kind of through the phases of what has happened with testing, there's a particular step of this testing when you take a sample, you have to prepare it, and you have to extract the RNA from the sample so that it's not diluted or destroyed by the actual cells that you're breaking apart. These are called RNA prep kits. One of the companies that I used to work for, Kyogen, that I've sold a couple of companies to, is the premier place in the world to make these prep kits. Um, and they're located in Hilden, Germany. They've gone into 24-hour, three-shift work, and they're trying to actually export the ability to do this in different places around the world so that this is not something that will be a bottleneck. But this is going to be a bottleneck at least moving forward. And uh, making sure everybody can still hear me, let me keep going. So we are trying to come up again with technical solutions to this problem. And let me talk a little bit about that. I just want to say we probably won't know the extent of all the problems that we're seeing with this until the uh, special documentary comes out in Netflix in about a year that tells us exactly what was going on that kept testing from happening about five weeks earlier to about a hundred times what it should be. Okay, so we are seeing a lot of startups uh, and I'm going ahead and using these as an example. There are big companies, small companies, research labs that are all pitching in on this, but these are really interesting because I think in the next couple of years, they will point the way to the future. I'm mentioning Biomeme, Chai Bio, Sherlock Biosciences, Mammoth Biosciences. Those last two are actually using CRISPR to be able to look and diagnose these diseases. But let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about these first two. Biomeme, or Ch I'm sorry, Chai Biosciences was actually founded by Josh Perfetto, who's one of the co-founders of BioCurious, the first biohacker space in the world. And they have an open hardware and open software approach to providing these PCR machines. They are already developing their own coronavirus environmental testing. This is not clinical testing, although really it's just a regulatory barrier that could keep it from being that. And this is a chance for people who want to go out, whether they're citizen scientists or corporations, people who are trying to make sure their workplace is clean, swab different surfaces and be able to say, hey, we can go ahead and tell if coronavirus is there. The idea of this being proactive instead of reactive and understanding when contamination is taking place. Here's another company, Biomeme, where they're making handheld PCR machines, uh, RT-PCR machines, that are able to run these tests and assays. This is really incredible. And again, they've responded so quickly just in the last week. They have made an environmental test for SARS-CoV-2. You can go ahead, I think it's uh, $300 for 20 tests. So you get an idea with all of these that what they're trying to do is make this accessible point of care. It's about 10 or $15 per sample. And both of those companies will have something that is available in an hour. The one in Biomeme is available now. The one at Chai Bio should be available in the next week or two. And so the ability of startups to innovate and react very quickly, we've known about this in our ecosystem for a long time, but expect to see more good things there. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about writing DNA and particularly as this applies to being able to do things with coronavirus and therapeutics. And there are two main pieces I just wanted to mention quickly. One, we all know about vaccines and the idea where you can go ahead and take pieces of an inactivated virus like was done with smallpox and inject that into somebody so that their immune system gets a look at it, gets used to it, and is able to build up immunity. Well, because of synthetic biology, we don't even have to take a, a, an inactivated virus, a live virus, an attenuated virus. We can now just take a piece 
of a virus that we know the genetic code for and make that piece without making anything else and then go ahead and use that to get the body to respond. And what's really interesting is we're going even beyond that, which has a fairly long production ramp up to this new idea of RNA vaccines. So don't even make the proteins of the virus, forget about even going out and finding attenuated viruses. What we're gonna do is go ahead and inject people with RNA for particular pieces of the virus, let their own immune systems, their own bodies, their own cells make copies of these particular pieces and then incorporate that in the innate immunity. So these become antigens, your immune system becomes used to this. There are several companies that are working on this. This particular diagram is from Moderna. There are some interesting issues with how do you basically program cells either in the body or by taking them out of the body and changing them and putting them back in, maybe using a person's own cells or maybe a universal donor. So the delivery of this kind of a system is going to be a big deal. But this is the kind of thing whenever I say that we're in the first battle of the last war against communicable disease, this is exactly what I mean. Maybe even more going beyond that, the idea of CRISPR vaccines. So anybody who's ever heard me talk about digital biology knows that CRISPR is a really interesting technology bringing about a renaissance in genetic engineering. It's a programmable pair of scissors. It's able to go ahead and cut DNA or RNA where you tell it to. And so the idea here is if we know the particular sequence of a virus, a critical part of it or just really anywhere in it, couldn't we go ahead and program up CRISPR to chop that virus up whenever it's introduced into either our cells or our environment? And we're starting to look at this as not just a possibility for a coronavirus, but something where any given virus, RNA virus or DNA-based virus, we would be able to come up with a way to use CRISPR to get rid of it. And if we do this right at scale, this won't be something that is just for the developed world. This will be something that scales well to the developing world. Um, to know a little bit more about this, a really fantastic paper came out in November of 2019 talking about doing this. As actually one of the people who uh, was responsible for helping invent CRISPR and develop it, where they use a new form of CRISPR to do exactly this as a demonstration on several different viruses. And if you don't really want to read a scientific paper, the New York Times had fantastic coverage of this, one of the best pieces of science journalism that I've seen in the last uh, several years. So take a look at that. And let me repeat, all of these resources will be available from me along with uh, this presentation. So then I want to go ahead now and talk about this last part or next to the last part, doing it right by doing the right thing. And what I mean is we are learning lessons, not just from how we put out the fire in our house now, but how we can keep fires from happening. We need to realize this is not the last pandemic that we're going to see. Although all these technologies that we have have been lessening the effects of pandemics as we go forward, and there have been fewer and fewer people affected there have been more and more of these, and this is going to continue to happen as long as we live in the center of those three circles where we have huge urban densities of population, where we have fast global travel with a, a hugely exponentially increasing middle class that is able to afford to jump on a jet and go anywhere, and where we have a loss of habitat, where humans are encroaching on natural species, where some unknown weird little disease was endemic and then makes the jump to humans and then possibly becomes epidemic and pandemic. Now, really, if we look at it, this idea of zoonotic diseases, things that are being disturbed in the wild where we now have new species, including humans meeting up, this is just a special case of what we're starting to call the Holocene extinction. And if you look at this, these are the top 10 causes of extinction of species. Well, humans are responsible for seven, maybe eight or nine of these. I think we can give ourselves a pass for asteroid strikes. Although NASA, I'm looking at you, we need to do some more stuff about that. But 
what do we do in this larger picture to look at some of these things that are more threatening than what's going to happen over the next year or two with our current crisis situation? Well, my favorite answer to this is an organization called Conservation X Labs, and they're hacking extinction. Their idea is to go ahead and really fundamentally change the way we do conservation and try to use Silicon Valley tools, memes, and people to come up with new ways to be able to fight what is the largest global extinction that we've seen in a million years. I will have references to some things that they're doing, including a handheld DNA reader um, in my notes, and you're welcome to those. But please, if you are interested in this at all, this is a fantastic organization to check out. The next thing is talking about funding the whole global epidemic preparedness piece. I, without going into history or pointing fingers, we've had uh, different agencies in different parts of the world for public health defunded that should have been trebly funded. And whenever we look at this, the idea that we could actually have a global task force resonant in different places, including possible hotspots that could respond very quickly to these and coordinate with a lot of different bodies. We could do this along with this other project I want to talk about for around $70 billion, which is a lot of money, until you realize, like I did looking at my 401k, in one day we saw world stock markets lose between $1.2 and $1.9 trillion. And if we had better responses to these kind of things, that would not be something that has to happen. The other thing I wanted to mention on this, this book of life piece, there's this idea that instead of just even having a fast response team for pandemics, what we really want to do is have a better understanding of all the animals, plants, and microbes in our world. And in fact, if you just look at the pages in the book of life that are probably zoonotic diseases, meaning, you know, basically when animals cough on each other, what they get that don't necessarily make jumps to other species. We think that they're probably on the order of 10 million of those, on the close order of 10 million of those. We probably have a handle on less than 3,000 of those. So understanding those better is not just a research project that is interesting, but it becomes something that is more and more vital. And whenever you actually put that together with a global pandemic task force with boots on the ground in different countries, that $70 billion price tag covers a huge amount of that. Here's the other thing. I want to emphasize that we are all in this together. And one of the things we need to do is act locally. And we're seeing weird behavior right now as people are getting justifiably freaked out, but doing things like buying up toilet paper and hand sanitizer. Here's the thing, uh, and I know the people watching this are not really the people that I'm speaking to, but this is a really good way to be able to think about this and adjust thinking and talk about this to other people. The value of having hand sanitizer is not to have a lot of it to use yourself. The value of having hand sanitizer is to create a barrier so that the people around you don't get sick. So think about this. If you are with a group or out in public and you've got some hand sanitizer, please share it. Say, does anybody need to use this? Would you like to do this? You know, help people wipe down their grocery carts, that kind of thing. And we're, I think, at that point where we want to be not just good Samaritans, but it's in our own enlightened, selfish best interest. Here's the other part. We're all in this together. Think globally. And here the idea is just that public health, the ability to anticipate, find, and control epidemics happens a lot better instead of in one person's neighborhood or tribe or city or country. It's best whenever it happens even outside your borders. You want to really go ahead and control these things by knowing about them and being to act able to act on them quickly. And I mean very specifically, for instance, as a United States citizen, proudly, this is the kind of thing where our idea of 
controlling and reacting to a global pandemic shouldn't be stockpiling. It should be having boots on the ground in the places where that's going on and being able to provide aid to help contain it before it gets started anywhere in the world. This is a chance, I really think, for us as a civilization to mature. And these are some of the first really great examples of how, as a species, as a globe, we will all be able to hang together or separately. So the other piece that I mentioned earlier is the health inequality. Countries that do not have rich, technologically advanced healthcare systems will be beyond woefully prepared to handle this, either in the testing or the treatment. Uh, being able to find ways to go ahead and gear up and manufacture both tests and therapeutics, uh, the high-tech things that I've been talking about, but even like simple, cheap respirators and aids to people who are able to do that kind of piece, being able to do triage, being able to do diagnosis will become incredibly important. And then just in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to finish up this one part and talk about next steps. And specifically, these are my next steps. So as we're going forward, we have got to learn new ways to do things. And I want to be clear. I don't think that as a civilization, we change where no one's ever going to shake hands again. I think we're in the middle of a, a crisis and this will happen for weeks or months or maybe a couple of years, although I don't think we'll all be huddled behind our walls of toilet paper for a couple of years. But while we do need to change the way we do some things, other things won't change that much. What we all are going to need to do is learn how to do new things. So I started by going ahead and learning how to present remotely with this package. I hope it's been useful and not distracting. Please let me know. But the big thing that I'm going to start doing as we pulled my kids out of school last week and said, we're probably going to be home for a while. I am now going to be doing projects with them based around molecular biology, uh, biohacking, learning how to build and do things themselves. And the kids and I, my 13-year-old twin superheroes, have made a commitment to each other. We're going to film this. We're going to write up lesson plans. We're going to share what we do. And I hope that's going to be useful and of interest to people. Uh, we're just starting a Patreon and YouTube account for this. If you want to know more about it, write me at howdy at RaymondMcCauley.net. The other thing, I'm going to be participating in the EXO World Conference, EXO World Live, uh, 14th through 16th of April. So that's my next way to learn how to do public speaking but not leave the house. And the other thing, I am going to start holding virtual office hours on Fridays. And I'm going to use that to talk to people that I talk to for my business, which is investing and consulting in non-traditional biotechnologies, but also, you know, not just to new entrepreneurs or people who are investing or looking at doing new things, to talk to people who are working on not-for-profit projects, to talk to students, to talk to people who are interested in some of the things we're going to do with the Platypus Project. So again, if you're interested in that, look at my social media and post to me at howdy at RaymondMcCauley.net. We'll let you know as that goes on, and we'll keep adapting it to see how it works best. And then finally, if you would like a copy of these slides, if you would like a copy of a document where I'm making sure all the different links to supporting materials are available and different articles along with about a brief paragraph for each one, please email me today, tomorrow, the next day at that email address, and I will send you information on all of the things in this slide. And then my final thing, what do we owe each other going forward? I think that's an interesting question. I think that we have choices to make going forward, and we have choices where there's been a lot of talk about lack of leadership and things that could have happened better. And I think a lot of that's true, but I think really we all have the opportunities to be our own best leaders in our communities and our families and carry the torch forward for the things that should be done. This is a 
defining moment, I think, not just for this decade or even the 21st century, but for the human species. So how we choose to handle things and what we do going forward is going to be one of the most important things. Technology is going to be incredibly important in this, but the most important thing is going to be how we treat each other. Having said that, uh, let me give one piece of techno gadget advice. If you are going to be at home, if you are in a high risk area where there's an outbreak, of course, you're going to be doing things like taking your temperature and staying with your family. If you don't already have a blood oxygenation monitor, one of those little things that goes on your finger that will look at your blood oxygenation, consider getting that or working with neighbors to make sure that you have one. If someone in your family, in your community gets sick, that's going to be one of the best ways to tell if they need critical care is monitoring blood oxygenation. And uh, you're not going to want to be taking a lot of trips to hospitals that are going to be germy and overburdened. So that's my thing that I think I owe you is my best little piece of advice going forward. But I'll just end with, I hope we can all do good things and be excellent to each other. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time to look at this, share with me. Please let me know things that I don't know about. And I look forward to seeing you more in the future and online. Thank you. That was fantastic, Raymond. Um, you got lots of good feedback. People are very curious about the uh, the tool that you're using for your slides. You said it was Prezi, right? That's correct. This is a version of Prezi called Prezi Video. And one of the things it's so hard whenever you're trying to talk to people and you want to go ahead and present information and you'd kind of like to be able to talk to it. I actually learned this in the last 48 hours because I wanted to do a good job and I wanted to share this. And in fact, uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do with my office hours. One of the things is I might go ahead and take people through a really quick tutorial on how I use some of these tools because we're all going to have to learn how to work online better and more efficiently. Absolutely. No, I, and for everybody who hasn't heard of that company before, it's uh, Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I, uh, P-R-E-Z-I. Fantastic startup company, now several years old, but founded by a couple of entrepreneurial kids in uh, Budapest, Hungary. Oh, how about that? I did not know that. Oh, yeah. They they wanted to make a PowerPoint killer. No offense to, to Microsoft, but, you know, it's it makes you look 30% smarter whenever your slides move around. So, and we all need all the help we can get. So true. So true. Assuming that the moving around works, I've seen, I've seen Prezi go bad, but generally speaking, <laughs> you, you nailed it for learning it relatively new. Um, all right. I'm going to try to cherry pick some of these questions that I think are more up your alley than some of the other speakers. Um, okay. The first one is, do you think the Sherlock testing kits on paper strips could help us with the amount of time it often takes to test COVID? So let me, the virtue of being uncertain, I don't know how quickly some of those things and with Sherlock Bio in particular, is, that's going to be available. And some of that might be available right now. Some of it might not scale up and be readily available. But yes, uh, in general, that approach, uh, paper sort of point of care or point of use testing is going to be uh a killer app going forward for genomics technology. All of the advances we've seen in genomics technology, whenever I talk about how we've reduced the price of sequencing to, from $3 billion to under 20 bucks, that is true and that works whenever you're doing a million sequences and you want to do a million and one, that's your marginal cost. And it's true and it works whenever you want to take a swab and send it off in the mail and wait three weeks. This is not going to work for our current things. So we're going to have to make jumps and leaps with doing these point of care testing pieces. Um, let me make a quick little shout out. I mentioned in there Conservation X Labs. It's a not-for-profit. They are actually developing technologies and spinning out for profits with the idea that, you know, the things that move fast and, and break things and get successes are corporations. And they have started a corporation called Thylacine Biosciences that has a handheld DNA detector that may be really adaptable to our current thing. Several people are moving forward with this. I don't think they're going to be wrong things. We're going to just have a plethora of new pieces to try. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think what you were talking about um, earlier, I can't remember if it was in the green room or here about how we're going to have all this innovation come in that's going to generate a whole lot of new data with slightly different standards potentially. And then we're going to have to figure out, well, what do, what do we do with it? How do we standardize it? How do we make sense of it? Yeah, and, and to, to, to comment on that really quickly, we saw in the United States, which, and I just have to say, it's, it's a criminal shame that with our amazing resources biotechnologically, we just had a lot of basically bureaucratic indecision that hamstrung folks going forward, waiting for a standard for a test that didn't work at first and then wasn't widely distributed, wasn't allowed to be used. Now so many people have responded, we're going to have 40 different tests and we don't necessarily have a clearinghouse authority to even count those up. Um, we're going to see this in other countries too, the idea that people are because of lack of availability of testing, underdiagnosed, you can't react to a situation without information, and we don't have good ground truth information when we don't know how many people are infected or who's infected. Right, right. Uh, I think we'll we'll stay on that government one real quick. Um, Bruno has has kindly been persistent with us. Um, he looks like he's in Brazil and has noted that uh, the government believes that their government is not isolating as much as they should. They're not doing as much testing as they should. Uh, information might not be disclosed. I imagine that's probably true for countries around the world. Any thoughts on what we can do as citizens to help our governments take action right now? I think part of being our best selves, right? Part of our being our own leaders and superheroes is uh, speaking out on this. There's a little bit of a fine line. Let me be clear. Let me kind of draw it back. Um, social media is a really good way to get upset <laughs> and social media is a good way to kind of panic and incite panic in others and, you know, cause people to have truckloads of toilet paper. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with saying, speaking up and saying, you know, we need to understand when do we close our schools? We need to understand when does social distancing take place? The thing too is you don't have to wait for your government to mandate some of these steps. You can start doing this. I'll say, and let me tell on myself, I have actually been in virtual isolation for about the first four weeks, uh, the last four weeks, because as things were going on, whenever we saw our first cases of community spread, I thought, oh my God, this is horrible. Knowing what I know about the spread of, of, of epidemics, that means a lot is going on that we're not hearing about. But I didn't say a lot about it because I didn't want to sound panicky and I didn't want to be somebody who was remembered for that. And it's one of those, uh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't things. But I kind of think we're now in the situation where you're darned if you do and damned if you don't. So, um, uh, Balaji Srinivasan, who is a really interesting guy and fun to follow on Twitter, has said before, you know, you can panic early or panic late. It's, there's no virtue in keeping calm whenever you need to get some things done fast. So the idea is panic now. You know, the idea is, of course, not to panic, but try to get things done so that you're well prepared. I, I feel pretty good in my family. Uh, a lot of close friends are. I feel pretty bad. I have some friends who are otherwise really intelligent who were still doing the whole, this is the flu. Why is anybody worried about it even days ago? And a few people I've had that conversation with. Um, I, I think we owe it to each other to have really open, honest conversations. And we owe it to each other to not blame each other for making the wrong call in the past, right? We're going to go forward with incomplete information. We're going to be course correcting and that's okay. The, the only bad thing is to not course correct. Uh, all right, let's try to sneak in one last question here. Let me see if I can find it. It was also about testing. Uh, I'll try to be short too, if we can get in too. Uh, okay. So Barbara asks us, is there testing being developed for people who maybe have had the virus? but didn't know it. So they will eventually be able to know if they have the antibodies or the immunity to it moving forwards. Absolutely. Uh, so all of this testing, we will be able to see um, people who have the viral load now, which is the, the big um, 
priority, but we're going to be able to do testing where we're able to basically look at someone's history and see if they've gotten the antibodies for that. And in fact, at some point, we'll probably be testing people before we give them vaccines, which, um, and this is where I blow doing the short answer, vaccines were something that took decades before. Up until today, that was about a four-year process. We're now looking at that being a year, a year and a half. And we're now looking at by doing some loop around some of the bureaucratic and regulatory stuff and some of these technical advances, I still think it'll be a year and a, a year and a half before we have widespread vaccines, but we may see first responders, things like that, being able to get some of these protective technologies before that. I really do think, like I say, we're in the first battle of the last war against disease. Yeah. All right. Last question, maybe some some of the softball, but I love the the platypus channel that you're working on. Uh, can you give us an idea of what some of those first projects are going to be that you're going to share with your kids? Yeah. Um, so we're actually we 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 sat down and we generated a whole bunch of ideas the other day. Some of them because they, they keep asking me questions about daddy, what is PCR? We hear you talk about it. We know a little bit about it, but what's the deal? We're going to do some PCR at home. I've got PCR machines in my lab in the garage. Uh, I've got homemade PCR machines that different people have, but you can actually, the same thing that you use to do Easter eggs, where you dip them and dye them, you just can do the same thing with a hot water bath and a cold water bath and do PCR. We're going to do that. We're going to make, um, we're going to learn about the genetic code by making necklaces where each of the beads are a nucleotide or an amino acid and talk about that. We're actually going to have some ethics discussions about some of the things going on. There's a really interesting situation where uh, a flu study in Washington understood that they could go ahead and go back and look at their samples and see if there was early exposure in Washington state. And they said, but ethically, we're not allowed to do that. And they said, but let's go ahead. And was that the right decision or not? And you can make a case on either side. And already just starting to have these discussions, it's amazing. Anybody who thinks your kids are going to be scared or can't handle this, Get them a copy of Plague, Inc. on their app. And my kids have been playing that for six years. Whenever we had the whole problem pop up with Ebola, and I said, let's sit down and talk about Ebola. They're like, Dad, we're not worried. That's going to die out because the R0 is high, but people, I was like, how do you know that? We're playing Plague, Inc. I was like, okay. Whenever we started talking about coronavirus, they said, you know, on, on day one in, in January, they're like, Dad, this looks pretty serious. What are we doing about this? Because they understood how an epidemic works from playing a simulation. So we're going to explore all these kind of things. There will be a lot of hands-on. There will be a lot of – we're going to critique movies. Uh, I'm going to make them watch the Andromeda strain from the 70s, and they're going to be like, why didn't people have cell phones? You know, all of that. So, uh, and, and I'm looking for really good ideas to share. On Patreon, we're going to have some places where people can kind of vote on what should we do next. And I'm hoping to get the first things out in the next week, not be a perfectionist, but just put things out there for people to act and react to. I love it, man. Well, best of luck with that. Um, I will, I'm an adult with no kids, but I will definitely be tuning in um, as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, hopefully we can have you back again sometime soon, but good luck with all your projects. I know Absolutely. that our audience will be interested and we'll, uh, we'll share those links out later on. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Don't forget howdy at RaymondMcCauley.net, and I'll make sure I dump everything that we are updating you on. And if there's a chance, any questions we didn't answer, if I can get a text uh, cut and paste of that, I will try to answer as many of those as I've got time for. Super. Thank we will definitely get, get that out to you. Um, we'll see you out there. All right. That does it for Raymond's session. Uh, let me pull up my... Uh, my slide with links and all that kind of good stuff. Gosh, you'd think that I'd be faster at this by now, but just not yet. All right. Um, so here we go. So the first thing that people were asking about, uh, next strain, uh, that is N-E-X-T-S-T-R-A-I-N. Uh, check that out. That's the site that Raymond was uh, referring to. You can get in touch with him, howdy at RaymondMcCulley.net. Once again, all sessions will be recorded. Uh, if you missed anything or the audio or the video cut out, go back and watch the replay here in about a minute when I stop this session. Uh, Raymond obviously volunteered to answer the, as more of your questions. 
Um, I'm doing my best to pick the ones that are relevant to who's talking versus what's going to be covered uh, later. So um, some of these will be will be answered down the line. Uh, congratulations, everybody. We maxed out the WhatsApp group. Maybe it wasn't the best decision, but uh, it at least showed that there was interest. So instead, we have created a Facebook group now uh, for people to go in, which I think should be much, much better for discussions and comments and intros and collaboration. So um, this is the link to join that. It's open to anybody who is on this stream. And then, of course, if you have ideas or, or about uh, some of the challenges that we're facing, go and check out the challenges that we've posted on the Be Innovative platform um, and get some thoughts going there. So with that, um, I will be wrapping up this session. We have uh, three more sessions left today. If you can't stick around, that's fine. Come back and watch the replays later. We're going to keep going and then we'll see you again tomorrow morning Pacific time. Um, it looks like there's been a lot happening today out in the world uh, with more and more uh, lockdowns and, and measures going on. Um, so we'll have those updates for you uh, tomorrow morning. But otherwise, keep keep watching. Stay home. Um, enjoy the content. And I will see you here in about, in about five to ten minutes for our next session.